Welcome everyone. Welcome to the virtual open house for the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing. I'm Sophronia Scott. I'm director of the program and your mistress of ceremonies for this glorious evening. So we are the first graduate program in Alma's 134 year history. Uh, this is, um, Alma, if you don't know it, is an academic institution dedicated to the study of the liberal arts. We are based in Alma, Michigan, which is about an hour north of Lansing. Uh, we have a lot to share with you this evening. So uh, we are going to, well, let me show you the agenda. So you'll see where we're going here and how we're gonna get through all of this fabulous uh, information. We have, by the way, Olivia Gibson is our administrative assistant and she is going to be moving my slides for me, but she will also be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A. So if you have questions for any of our awesome faculty, you can put that in the Q&A and she will break in at times uh, throughout our talk, uh, not during the readings though, uh, to ask your question. You can also ask questions of the particular faculty and uh, and this is our schedule for what we're doing today. We are going to hear from Jeff Abernathy, who is the president of Alma College. We're going to talk about the MFA program itself and how it works. We will hear from faculty Matthew Gavin Frank and Leslie Contreras Schwartz. Then we'll talk about visiting writers and publishing experts. We'll talk about how the residencies in the program work, will work. Then you'll hear from Donald Quist and Benjamin Garcia. We'll discuss the degree itself, the options that you have in terms of your plan of study and the requirements for your graduation. We will uh, then hear from Jim Daniels and Anna Clark. We'll talk about the application process and what we'll need to see from you to uh, participate in the program. Uh, we will hear from Danielle Clayton and Karen E. Bender. Then we'll talk about tuition and financial aid and wrap up. And as I said, we will we will be answering questions throughout the program and feel free to uh, ask a few more at the end and I will let you know how to connect with me after that. So to begin with, I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful president, Jeff Abernathy. And I have to tell you, if you know this uh, photo of uh, Jim, I'm uh, sorry, of Jeff, uh, this is how you will see him on campus riding his bicycle and you will know that he is in his office when you see that bicycle parked by the door. Jeff Abernathy is celebrating his 10th anniversary as president of Alma College. In addition to his duties as the college's chief executive officer, he also teaches courses for the Alma College English Department in Environmental Literature. He is the author of To Hell and Back, Race and Betrayal in the Southern Novel, published by the University of Georgia Press. The book considers the construction of race in the Southern novel and American culture using Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn as an archetypal text. He is a native of Richmond, Virginia. He has his bachelor's degree from Longwood College, master's degree in English from Virginia Commonwealth University, and a PhD in American literature from the University of Florida. And this MFA has actually Jeff's idea and he has been the guiding force behind bringing it to life. So thank you, Jeff. Oh, thank you, Sophronia, and thanks to our faculty. Uh, we are so excited about uh, this uh, new program. It's our first master's program, it's, it's true, and so proud that we can offer our very first master's program in the core humanities. Alma College is a liberal arts uh, college, and as such, we're just very, very proud of uh, this new effort, new initiative of the college uh, to uh, reach out uh, to, uh, to students uh, and to, uh, to bring students here from diverse backgrounds uh, and prepare them uh, to go off to the world to publish their novels and their collection, uh, collections of poems and the like. Uh, the collection of faculty that you will meet tonight that Sophronia has gathered to get together are truly incredible. Uh, we uh, could not be prouder of uh, the opportunity we have to bring these faculty together at Alma College to offer this new degree. So welcome everyone. We're pleased to, that you could join us tonight. Uh, welcome as well to our, our faculty and Sophronia, I'll turn back to you. Thank you, Jeff. So you may be wondering, what is a low residency MFA program? And how does it work? It is a two-year degree and it is ideal for the adult learner. You know, for someone who can't step away from their job and their life to pursue a degree, 
Uh, this, uh, this is also a degree that's ideal for retirees, people who may have wanted to write their whole lives and just never have the time or energy to focus on it. So because of that, we tend to have um, in low residency MFAs cohorts that have a range of experiences uh, from newer writers to people who've always wanted to write to people who've done some publishing. So because of that, it's a wonderful energetic mix. It's a two-year degree. And the way it works is that you come for two 10-day residencies, one in the summer and one in the winter. During those residencies, you'll attend lectures, you will uh, do workshops and other presentations, which we'll talk about a little later this evening. But um, then you get paired off with one of our wonderful faculty uh, mentors, and you will work with that person one-on-one -on -one for five months, submitting five monthly packets of creative and critical work. You'll find that with this kind of uh, focus and intentional effort, you will progress so quickly in the program. If you could advance that slide there for me, Olivia. What you'll learn over the course of this program uh, at graduation, you will find uh, that you've developed a proficiency of writing skills, including the strong use of organization and structure and adept use of language uh, and forming and communicating well-developed ideas with creative thought and expression. You'll have a strong understanding of craft and even the ability to lecture on technique. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly connected to that ability because you know, I was already a published person when I uh, went into my MFA program myself, but I didn't understand why I was a good writer. I didn't understand my craft. It was almost like uh, I was wielding this wand and didn't know exactly how it worked. So craft is, is the foundation of well, what, make you, what will help make you a confident writer. You will also have the ability to read and think critically as a writer and you will develop a knowledge of the publishing industry. And I'll talk more a little later about the experts who we will have at our residencies to help you do that. Uh, this understanding will include how to get published in a variety of venues and understanding where your writing fits best. So next up, we are going to have our first faculty readers. We are going to start with Matthew Gavin Frank and Leslie Contreras Schwartz. Matthew Gavin Frank is the author of nonfiction books, including The Mad Feast, an ecstatic tour through, uh, through America's food and preparing the ghost, an essay concerning the giant squid and its first photographer. And he's also the author of poetry books, including The Morrow Plots, Warranty in Zulu and Sagittarius Agiprop. Preparing the Ghost was a New York Times editor's choice, an NPR notable book, and a New Yorker book to watch out for. His forthcoming nonfiction book is Flight of the Diamond Smugglers, which among other things is about the ways in which car carrier pigeons are use used by diamond smuggling rings. That book is due out in February from W.W. Norton's Live Right imprint. Leslie Contreras Schwartz is the fourth Houston Poet Laureate. She's the author of three collections of poetry, Black Dove, Paloma Negra, Fuego, and Night Bloom and Cenote. A semi-finalist for the 2017 Tupelo Press Dorset Prize, judged by Ilya Kaminsky. She has collaborated or been commissioned for poetic projects with the city of Houston, the Houston Grand Opera, and the Moody Center of the Arts at Rice University. So thank you both. Glad to be here. So Matthew, you're up first. All right, great. Um, I loved what uh, you said, Sophronia, about um, how when you went to the MFA program, uh, you had already published, but you didn't necessarily know exactly what it was that you were doing well. And that's one of the wonderful things that I got out of my MFA program um, too, even though I, I was not nearly that advanced um, when, I, when I entered into it. Um, I had no idea what I was good at. Um, I had no idea what my work was doing. And I love that kind of um, constructive criticism that allows us to build off of what we're doing well and allows us to find out what I exactly it is that we're doing well and why. Um, with regard to nonfiction, uh, my favorite nonfiction essays uh, 
um, don't necessarily presume certainty, but they, they're, they're questing after something. Um, they want to capture something and, and track something toward uh, what they likely misperceive as a version of truth. Um, these essays are often scratching at one particular thing while, while examining it through the lenses of, of various other things until its gooey inner holiness or, or, or horror begins to leak out. Um, until the subject matter yields its, its best secrets. Um, and, and so my students and I go on this sort of constructive journey together, um, creating a safe space in which to uh, stretch out and experiment and converse and take risks and, and therefore discover surprising things about our work and our lives and our obsessions. Um, and so I, I really look forward to, to getting beautifully and essentially lost together um, because in writing that's often the only way to find certain things. Um, and I'm just really, really excited to be working with you Sophronia and with this entire crew. It's, it's just a, a dream crew. Um, I'm gonna read a short piece. It's, it's, a, it's about six and a half minutes long, um, a short nonfiction piece. And, uh, by way of introducing it, um, I'll just mention um, this. Uh, the poet Alberto Rios um, once spoke about trying to write a piece about uh, the death of his father uh, and his attendant grief. And eventually, Rios told me on, on his 11th draft or something, um, he spoke about having to turn away from the explosion, as he called it. He had this technique um, that he would employed, I guess, during his 11th draft, where he would turn away from the explosion. And, and what he meant by that was that he had to turn away from that very scrap of subject matter about which he wanted to write. Uh, his endurance of grief in the aftermath of his father's death in order to record what was going on in the opposite direction, so to speak. Um, the stuff lurking in the margins. Uh, kind of as, as if forcing himself to glimpse the stars only via his peripheral vision by which they appear the brightest to us. Um, and so I'm going to read this, this short essay um, uh, that I wrote in which I forced myself in part to turn away from my own grief, um, from my own intense experience, and I found lurking in the opposite direction, pigeons. Pigeons, of all things. Um, this, uh, this is called A Brief Atmospheric Future. If we're to believe the neuroscientist Professor Marcus Pembry from University College London, who concluded that behavior can be affected by events in previous generations, which have been passed on through a form of genetic memory, phobias, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders, even sensitivity to a cherry blossom scent? Well, then the pigeon knows of its ancestors' lives as Genghis Khan's messengers, as carriers of Tipu Sultan's poetry, silk plantation blueprints, and schematics for the advancement of rocket artillery. The pigeon knows that it was once used to announce the winners of the Olympics, the beginnings and ends of wars, that Paul Reuter, founder of the Reuters Press Agency, compelled its progenitors to transport information about stock prices from one telegraph line terminus to another, that apothecaries depended on them for the delivery of medicine, that rival armies trained hawks to eviscerate the pigeons of their enemies, causing a communication breakdown. That we've given to them our voices, that we've made of their bodies the earliest and most organic of radio waves. That when we place our faith in the tenacity of the carrier pigeon, our lives and our loves and our heartaches and our deaths can float above us. And the most important parts of our self-narratives are on air. I nose deeply into the feathers of my pillow. Know that a feather stripped of barbs is bone. 
the code of the body, the positioning system and the synapses, the electric impulses, the capillaries, the heart. My wife takes another pain pill and says something about trying again in the new year. That some couples, like her sister-in-law and brother, successfully conceive only after losing a half dozen. And when they're, like us, in their low 40s. Like us, the pigeon roosting in our eaves knows something, but does not know how it knows it. The bird does not even coo. The bird, in fact, shows no outward signs of pleasure or affection at all. The carrier pigeon's life is, is one of servitude and thereby mutilation, of flight girdled. Trainers have designed tiny backpacks fitted to the pigeon's bodies and filled with anything from confidential blueprints for spacecraft meant to land on Mars, to heroin meant for prison inmates, to declarations of love and war, to blood samples, to heart tissue, to diamonds, anything we secretly desire or desire to keep secret. Our underbellies, our interior lives, our fetishes, our wishes, some clandestine network mapping ethnographically, the diagrams and fluctuations of our ids, tied to bird backs and bird feet, twining the air above us, the air we're so busy trying to dominate, bring down to our level. Perhaps it's not God who has the answers to our seemingly unanswerable questions about ourselves, but the loaded up pigeons, some of whom in a crisis of weight will randomly land offer us a clue into the circulatory map of all the things we wish to hide from the rest of our species. The pigeons slither along shafts of air, shafts within shafts, wormholes. They don't eat worms so much as French fries, pretzel salt, hand-me-down popcorn. Anatomy dictates when the pigeon steps forward, its head, for just a moment, is briefly left behind. There's something buried both in their little backpacks and their anatomy. Diamonds, blood samples, bloodlines, codes. They aim to deliver all of these things to our waiting hands. My wife and I sit up in bed, stretch our hands out in front of us, fingers splayed. We do these exercises together to increase, as the OBGYN said, blood flow, to decrease the chance of her cramping in sleep. Our hands, enjoying a brief atmospheric future, waiting for the rest of our bodies to catch up. Our hands are the empty nests, the eggless zeros, reddening only because our hearts are beating with so many old sadnesses. We are ever circling our losses, trying to find the way into them so we can find the way out. Always getting over, always recovering. We need salve, medicine, and diamonds. We need to convince ourselves that we are strong enough to carry the weight of a pigeon. Their soft 9.3 to 13.4 ounce bodies. They come to us as we've trained them to do. They have popcorn skins in their throats, ketchup in their feathers. We've trained them well and they slither in the air above us recalling their serpentine ancestors, counting the seconds until they can land. Cheers. Thank you, Matt. Is, is that from your book, your forthcoming book? Um, 
It's uh, actually uh, uh, an essay I, I wrote from a, uh, that I cobbled together from scraps of the very early draft of that book. So there are sections of that essay that appear in the book, but not all together um, and, and, and peppered throughout. And then there are sections of that essay that just um, uh, are not in the book at all. So that just exists in, in that space. But That was beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Leslie. Thank you. And the, I'm, I'm so honored to follow Matt's, uh, or Matthew's beautiful work. So thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I love teaching. I truly enjoy working with students. And in this program, um, I'm looking forward to being able to, to work with someone and give them that attention that they're, they're wanting and need to make their writing better. Um, and pushing, pushing students to be brave to confront some of the craft issues that they may not realize that they are coming up against. So working with them and hoping to give them the opportunity to figure out how to do this on their own so that when they graduate, they can continue a practice that, or they look critically at their own work and are able to decide, make better decisions uh, about which direction they're going to go in. So that's my take on working with students. Um, it's always special to me because every student, um, they come as writers, you know, they have a lot of passion and they want to share their particular story. If it's not personal, it's some uh, perspective. And um, I am very grateful to be able to honor that through mentorship. So that's my take on it. So I'll go ahead and read. So a couple of these poems, this is from a new collection. A couple of these poems, I'll explain some context beforehand. So the first poem is called Bonefold, um, which was a, an instrument used traditionally in origami. Bonefold. She put her old fingered face in the young hands of the girl's slick gerbil baby face, soft fat and collagen plump. Skin fold purpling inside, gardenia lip days. The little one grabs the black grape eyes, pulls and eats the whitened skin and meaty pulp. I love you so and so, she tells the other. Her sweat sweetens, the elder running from her lips. I'll wear you as my suit, my body yours and mine. How handsome now, slipped inside one another, neatly folded, swallowed whole. How smarter in hips and thighs, flesh that holds knowledge, professor of body, its aching tiny pains. Mountain or valley pleasure in the ridged edges, filed carefully, what kept and what dropped. The skin's purse unburdened and the joys unfastened. Now together they eat their own origami heartbeats, spent and re-spent anew into pocket note, pocket crumble. At nighttime they carry their daughter's long limbs hanging off, hanging fruit off their hips. Selves full this evening with daughters and limbs all the selfish nibbles. Can we edge and crease Google fold all on our little own? Tightening this pattern making does and us unpretty of the single sheet and bone fold. Let's pretend you don't hold it to us down and flat, splayed out to iron and starch. Yes, we want the press, the crease, the hard line turn. 
We were made for this finger hold, hinged to invisible clip, hushing us. While we writhe with mouths serpentine, open and waiting for that one flap to flip. So this next poem is an ekphrastic poem um, written after a scribe's box from 15th century Granada, Spain. Um, it's in the uh, 2010 Art of Islamic Worlds exhibit in the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Mother in God Box. In here you make me strange. A necklace, a sweet, a nun hidden under your door. I live in this place of your torn light, married to lines and stars written in your door. Dear, how we meet each other inside, wild in the bazaar of longing, but private, kind, lightning in sacred forest, rendered in bright sea blue, earth and first fruit. We hold tighter under autumn in the door, my fat finger under the door jam. Plentiful the food inside, full tables, open doors, your tender cup, I see through the crack. A garden in a storm sing a million skies, I must all, it must always thunder under the door. But I'm content to exist in your squares, without the plum or the multiplying inside, even in the mind. The hinge doesn't break and never closes. Please open, open the door. The pretend seas of your eyes cleans me and I live another day. If I unlatch, the planets stop. No windows, without houses, no mountain or sky exist under our door. No door to your door. I carry faith, my beauty in your fat bottom lip. With each suckle, I invent the gifts under your door, in the door, in the box, besides, inside, above and below. Tomorrow waits I to be born again under your door. Dallas, 1983. Mother shielded my head, held my face against her left shoulder, hard and bone, the sharp of barely 90 pounds. The wind belting up leaves, newspapers, rubbish, and seeding aerosols beside shops selling cowboy boots and boutiques of gossamer child children clothes. The milky thin spread of mama's skin and the beaded necklace and faux lapis lazuli, lapis lazuli. From the stash, from the cheap, cheap stash her mother sold in the back of the closet with my blood tinged milk teeth. The red nailed sharp finger grasp of my mom's hands. I wanted midday sun and the earth green carpet of my grandparents tiny house. Instead, her palm at the back of my curly head and through the gaps of a baby blanket, its pale lemon and rose threads, I saw the street thrashed and clawed by an unseen body, the shape of my mother, her black hair sending trees crowning and bowing in long strands, presented as the world to my four-year-old mind, things whipped away with a hand, suddenly swollen, a skipping or a backhand belonging inside me. A sense in a newly formed cerebellum fissure, an infantile knowing built upon the peach of grocery store baby food, crusted metal spoon, the corners of my mouth, my own sugared saliva my refusal to eat the putrid drop dollops at the rental house on Hopper or the one on Frawley, a wet shock against tongue, the force of a hand in a spoon. But this day I laughed with glee 
how it rained sideways on us and soaked my head, pressed us together, a checkered blouse against a doll-sized white turtleneck, matching plum skirt made of felt, too expensive and precious. Inside the beginning of a storm, what I'd later, later recognize in the way it suffocated and stripped the roads and turns, front lawns, born naked and bone tight in an hour, slick as an oil rig. What I knew first and later as the only thing I would call my mother. And I have one more poem, how's my time? Uh, how short is it? <laughs> it's, it's pretty short. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'll talk, I'll get through my parts fast so that you guys okay. can read them. Go ahead. Um, you know what, that, I did plenty, so go, I'll- Go ahead, go, go, go. Okay. <laughs> a body's universe of big bangs. A body must re remind itself to keep living continually throughout the day. Even at night when sleeping, proteins, either messenger, builder, or destroyer, keep busy transforming itself or other substances. Scientists call these reactions to change their innate structure dictated by DNA, cellular frustration, a cotton cloud nomenclature for crusade, combat, warfare, aid, unification, scaffold, or sustain. Even while the body sleeps, a jaw slackened into an open dream Inside is the drama of the body's own substances meeting one another, stealing elements, being changed elementally, altered by a new story called chemical reaction. A building and demolishment, creating or undoing, the body can find movement, functioning organs, resists illness, or doesn't. Look inside every living being and find this narrative of resistance, the live feed of being resisted, the infant clasping her fist or the 98 year old releasing hers. This is how it should be, we think, a long story carried out to a soft conclusion. In reality, little deaths hover and nibble, little bursts opening mouths and bodies the sight of stories, the tales given to us and retold, never altered, and the ones forgotten, a changed, unremembered, until this place is made of only ourselves, our own small dictators, peacemakers, architects, artists, a derelict cottage, a monumental church, struck in gold, an artist's studio, layered with paints and cut paper, knives and large canvas, the site, the only place containing our best holy song. I will live, I will live, I will keep living. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And, and I'm happy that you read that because I think we, we need that feel of, of just that phrase, I will live. Right? That's, thank you for that. And while Olivia brings um, the slide back up, I just wanted to say that I meant what I said. You know, the things that I'm talking about, I'm really clarifying and, and providing detail for what is on the website, details about the program. But what you can't get on the website is, you know, these fabulous words from our faculty. So the more time you hear them read, and I will get through what I'm explaining to you, um, things like talking about our visiting writers and publishing experts, uh, which I'm particularly excited to talk about because the, the wonderful thing is that we have this fabulous faculty, but you will also get to experience craft talks by visiting writers. So you're gonna have such a wealth of talent and experience uh, working with you on your writing journey. So I'm excited to say, if you hadn't, didn't already know, that we are going to have the U.S. Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo, as our first visiting writer. She will kick off our first residency in June at Elma. She is an award-winning poet, writer, performer, and saxophone player. 
of the Muskogee Creek Nation tribe. She's authored nine books of poetry and a memoir and is the first Native American to hold the position of US Poet Laureate. Uh, we will also have presentations by publishing experts. Uh, you will hear from editors from large publishing houses, small presses, uh, literary agents, publicists, and you'll hear also from the editors of literary journals, as well as writers who have created their own workshops and retreats in their communities. So we do this because we want you to come away from the program with a full understanding of the choices that you have and so that you can make the best choices for your own writing. Uh, ways for you to understand how you want to publish, but also how you want to live as a literary citizen, um, how you will bring your writing into the community at large, even you know, locally or even a, a broader audience if that's what you're seeking. Next, I wanted to talk about our residencies. As I mentioned earlier, there will be two residencies a year, one in the summer and one in the winter. In the summers, we will be on our lovely campus in Alma, Michigan, and we will ba be based in the historic Wright Lapine Opera House. This is a building that Alma College purchased. Um, it's a historic building that Alma College purchased and renovated, and it features these gorgeous apartment style accommodations for the students. And we also have this gorgeous airy light filled ballroom for lectures and readings. Our residency uh, there, our first residency will be June 17th to the 27th in 2021. And, um, and as you'll see from the photos on the website, I, I will happily boast that I think we have the best accommodations of any MFA program. Uh, this is a gorgeous building. Our winter residencies will be at the Ralph A. McMullen Conference Center on the shore of Higgins Lake in Michigan's gorgeous northern woods. The center is known for its modern facilities, but with this uh, very nice rustic decor, and they are known for a legacy of conservation education. Uh, we will get to appreciate Michigan's abundant natural resources. Uh, they will also have activities for us, such as ice fishing, sledding, snowshoeing, uh, cross-country skiing and downhill skiing. Now, we are going to be doing our usual workshops and lectures, so there's plenty of work to do, but I also will let you know you will have time to have fun as well. Uh, the winter residency will be December 27th, 2021 to January 6th, 2022. I'm also excited by the fact that in January 2023, we will offer the option of meaning you can either go to the McMullen Center or you have the option of doing win winter residency at the University of Oxford in England. Uh, this will be at St. Hugh's College at the University of Oxford. Uh, if you should know, Oxford has hundreds of years of producing luminaries such as Oscar Wilde, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Indira Gandhi, and Stephen Hawking. And the program there will feature lectures from university guest speakers and tours of the iconic institution and town, including tours of the Sheldonian Theater, the Bodleian Library, the University Museum, and the Ashmolean. Uh, Alma is excited to partner with St. Hughes College and Grand Tourist Travel uh, to offer this opportunity to our MFA cohorts. So next up for our reading, we have Donald Quist and Benjamin Garcia. Donald Quist is author of the linked story collection For Other Ghosts and the essay collection Harbors, which was a Forward Indies bronze winner and International Book Awards finalist. His writing has appeared in Agni, Poets and Writers, North American Review, and Michigan Quarterly Review. He is also creator of the online nonfiction series Past 10. Donald has received fellowships from Sundress Academy for the Arts and Cambilio Fiction. Benjamin Garcia's first collection, Thrown in the Throat, was selected by Kazim Ali for the 2019 National Poetry Series. He works as a sexual health and harm reduction educator in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Benjamin had the honor of being a 2019 Lambda Literary Fellow, the 2018 Contamundo Fellow at the Palm Beach Poetry Festival, and the 2017 Latinx Scholar at the Frost Place Conference on Poetry. He is the winner of the 2018 Puerto del Sol Poetry Contest and the 2019 Julia, Julia Peterkin 
flash fiction contest. So thank you, Donald and Benjamin. Donald, you're up. Um, do I sound OK? Yeah? Yes, you do. OK, yeah. great. Um, thank you, Leslie and Matt, um, for those amazing readings. Um, I'm honored to get to work with you as well as everyone else here. Um, I'm really looking forward to what we can make together. So I'm going to read uh, part of an essay that is going to appear in a book that's forthcoming. Um, I'm working on an essay collection about the myth of Black criminality. Um, and it's written in a series of listed encounters similar to the Ponces by Pascal. Um, this was recently published in Michigan Quarterly Review, so I'm going to read it from there. Um, I won't be able to read all of it, but I look forward to sharing it with you if I see you in Alma in the summer, okay? So this is called The City Versus MLK. Maybe it was a lie by omission, my response when the judge inquired into my history. Standing for jury selection in the city's case against Montez Lamont King, I denied having any relationship with the prosecution that might affect my objectivity. But when asked to divulge connections with the arresting officer, any history, I avoided glancing over at Lieutenant Horton, who sat in the witness stand. If Lieutenant Horton remembered me from the ride along we shared many months earlier, she betrayed any signs of recognition. She looked perfectly composed with her hair pulled back into a tight bun and her uniform so neatly pressed and fitted that it lent her the authority of someone with a higher rank, like a chief or a general. But she remained polite and respectful of the central power in the room. In every response, the judge was followed by a quick and courteous, Your Honor. I've always wanted to embody that same composure, not just in the courtroom, but every day. I've always been attracted to a life in uniform, always admired the idea of being seen and regarded as someone heroic, not like a superhero, although that is another fantasy. I guess what I mean is I've always wanted to be someone whose self-sacrifice would be honored and remembered. And all I'm saying is maybe this predilection toward meaningful sacrifice and the desire to demonstrate what some might consider duty is why when asked by the judge if I had any history that might impact my ability to give a fair determination, I could feel my posture begin to mirror Lieutenant Horton, my back straightening, jaw tightening, as I looked solemnly at the head of the court and said, no, Your Honor. Weeks prior to the detention of Lamont King during a routine traffic stop, I accompanied the Lieutenant on a ride along. I observed Horton respond to three incidents Halloween weekend. The first, a domestic disturbance between two drunk lovers. We arrived in a cop car to find an African-American woman wearing a Holy Navy sleeping gown, a burgundy fleece pullover and lime bedroom slippers. She stood waiting for us in the street in front of a weather-stripped shotgun home sloping on its sinking foundation. Wait here, Horton said. Don't get out no matter what. Officer Horton's voice squawked through the radio mounted to the dashboard. Numbers in a current location broadcast to this and other cop cars in the area. Alone in the cruiser, I noted the minimal accessories to Horton's car. On a handle that jutted out of the cab and through the driver's door to operate the searchlight mounted above the side mirror, Horton had hung three additional pairs of handcuffs. The stark reality that there might be a need for the handcuffs clashed with the only accent of, of color in the car, a glittering butterfly-shaped hair beret clasped to the sun visor above her head, or above my head. Bedazzled with sparkling rainbow gems, the large clip could keep Horton's thick hair pulled tightly. The playful beret led me to wonder what Horton is like out of uniform. I tried to imagine her smiling, her laugh, perhaps a low hacking bark like a series of coughs, or maybe she snorts when she finds something really funny. Then I caught the clack pop of a screen door and then the flash of a human body blasting out of the front of the shotgun house. 
the body a shouting woman stumbling barefoot barreled at Horton and the civilian in the street. I rose bolt upright in my seat watching through the windshield and Horton held up a flat palm in front of her and the belligerent lady halted a few feet away still screaming at the woman in fluffy lime slides. Her ashen dreads shook as she yelled. The gray ropes sprouting from her head matched the patches of dray scales covering the skin of her arms and legs. I guessed that she was the reason we had been called here. The pair might have been in their 50s or perhaps much younger and aged by poverty. They didn't resemble each other. Cousins, perhaps. Roommates, maybe. And Horton watched the two of them argue for a couple of minutes. Horton rested her hands on her waist, just above her utility belt, her fingers inches above her taser and her gun. And eventually Horton raised her hand out again and calmed them. And as she spoke, I could see the shoulders of the civilians slowly drop and the taut cords of their necks relaxed. The women nodded at each other, looking upset, but somewhat in agreement. They turned away from Horton and returned to the house grumbling to each other, content enough with the threatening peace Horton had brought between them. And once they returned inside, Horton returned to the cruiser. I waited for her to settle into the driver's seat to call some words and numbers of the police radio before I asked, is everything okay? Oh yeah, she said, just a couple fighting. One got a little too drunk. And she smiled after that, recalling something she didn't share with me. Her lips twisted into a sly half crescent crashing into her right cheek. She laughed a little too, a quick goofy chuckle I could have never pictured. Lieutenant Horton and I made circuits around the city, a giant winding chain of streets linking the edges of gated communities and low income housing developments. And the cruiser crept through one of the HUD apartment blocks and kids playing in the parking lots froze as Horton and I rolled past. Basketball slid into storm drains and young girls and boys retreated slowly but steadily off the asphalt and onto the sidewalks and segments of brown grass leading to the shelter of their buildings. I noticed how the kids moved without taking their eyes off the cop car. Their bodies carried them away while their necks twisted to keep Horton and me in their sight. One little girl tripped over a curb, but popped onto her feet, her eyes on mine as Horton explained how people don't understand half of what officers actually do. You aren't trying to be jerks, she said. We're here to protect and serve. Yeah, there are a few bad cops, but it isn't all of us. We rode by a group of teenage boys gathered and laughing on the corner of one of the apartment structures. Their joking paused until they were in the rear view mirrors of the cruiser. It's not fair, right, Horton said, for all officers to be judged just because of a few. Now that's what I call prejudice. The majority of us just got into this to help people. And I asked Horton why she decided to be a cop. She told me she used to date an officer. She was in school to become a nurse then. Her boyfriend would often take her on ride-alongs. Horton found she enjoyed the driving, the hours, the workload, and the camaraderie between the officers. It was fun, she said. And I caught a reflection of my grimace on the passenger side window. I didn't like the thought of law enforcement being fun. And she asked me why I'd come on a ride along. And I said something about how I thought citizens had a duty to learn as much as they can about their local law enforcement. And I said something about community oriented policing. And then after several seconds of her silence, I confessed that some part of me has always wanted to protect others and serve communities I belong to. In another life, I said, I might have become a cop or a soldier. Horn told me I could join the force. The police department is in need of new officers, especially men of color, she said. She told me I could do a lot of good. I could inspire others. And I didn't ask who the others were or what I might inspire in them. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there, um, but yeah, it goes on.
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Donald. Thanks. Wow. Glad to be here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you you have to read the rest of that at residency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. That would be awesome. All right, Ben. Alrighty, hi there. Um, so my name is Benjamin Garcia, um, and um, I'm really excited to be joining uh, the faculty. Um, I'm honored to be here and to hear you read. Um, so um, I guess a, a little bit about my thoughts on teaching. Um, you know, a lot of my teaching now is based on sometimes the experiences that I've that I've had that weren't always necessarily um, what was useful to me in that moment. Um, like, I feel like a lot of uh, experiences were very prescriptive. Um, and I actually, for my workshops, I, I, I try to shy away from that instead of being prescriptive of, you know, this is how you fix this poem, uh, focusing more on what is this poem trying to do? What is this poet trying to do? Because, you know, in a workshop um, or even on a one on one encounter, someone else is writing very different kinds of poems. So, you know, what I might enjoy is not necessarily what this other person needs to do for their work. Um, and that's actually um, what helped me get to my first book. So, um, other things that sort of helped me was just sort of. Um, finding out what I enjoyed about these poems and really going into that. Um, and so I wanna help people find out, you know, what is it that they enjoy about writing? Because A, finding that joy is gonna be what helps you continue after a program. Um, you know, you're not gonna have the same kind of deadlines outside of a program. Deadlines can be helpful and motivate you, but outside of that, you know, um, finding out what you enjoy and how to get there. Uh, writing the poems that only you can write um, and that you enjoy and, and through your joy other people will um, will see that and, and that will come through. So with that in mind that's actually some of the poems that I'm reading today are um, a things that I enjoy. So I enjoy a lot of sound and um, word play um, and I also wanted to read poems that sort of went against some of the prescriptions that I got in workshop, which, you know, I was told, oh, you can't just focus on sound or like sound can't be the only motivating factor in a poem. Like this sounds good, but what is this actually saying? Um, and so I had to find a way to make that work. And, and so this poem is called Bliss Point or What Can Best Be Achieved by Cheese. Bliss point or what can best be achieved by cheese, AKA the other gold. Now that's the stuff, shredded or melted or powdered or canned. Behold the pinnacle of man in a Cheeto puff. Now that's the stuff you've been primed for, fatty and salty and crunchy and poof, gone. There's the proof, though your grandmother never even had one. You can't have just one. You inhale them, puff after puff after puff. You're a chain smoker, tongue coated and coaxed, but not saturated or satiated. It's like pure flavor, but sadder. Each pink ping in your pinball mouth, expertly played by the makers who have studied you, the human animal, and culled from the rind, you're even the shape of a cheese curl. Girl, come curl in the dim light of the TV, veg out on the verge of no urge of anything. Long ago, we beached ourselves, climbed up the trees, then down the trees, knuckled across the dirt and grasses and thorns and Berber carpet. Now is the age of sitting, so sit. And I must say, crouched on the couch like that, you resemble no animal, smug in your snuggie and snug in your sloth. You look nothing like a sloth and you are not an anteater. An anteater eats ants without fear of diabetes. Though breathing, one could say, resembles a chronic disease. What's real cheese and what is cheese product? It's difficult to say. But being alive today is real, real, really like a book you can't put down, a stone that plummets from a great height. Life's a page turner, all right. 
but don't worry if you miss the finale of your favorite show. You can catch it on cue. Make room for me and I'll binge on this, the final season with you. Um, and so part of getting to that poem was just sort of, you know, focusing on the sound and using sound as a way of finding out what I wanted to say. Um, this next one is a, is a poem. I think it's a poem, even though I actually published it as a, um, as a short um, essay, as a nonfiction essay. And um, I think that's something else that in workshop, I sort of had to uh, figure out by asking questions like, what is genre and does this fit into this other genre and um you know the even i won a fiction contest by submitting a poem that i was like this is also a fiction piece like you know and sent it in and you know so it's playing with form and with genre is something else that um i encourage my students to do the great glass closet this is not a metaphor when I say I lived in the closet, it's because I lived in the closet. You might too, if you shared a one bedroom apartment with 11 other people and a pet. Mother, stepfather, brother, 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 uncle, aunt, cousin, 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 dog. Then there's me, the surplus. You could have called our closet a walk-in closet in the sense that a child's body could walk in. Mine did, and I called it home. It was comfortable enough if you were willing to lie. I was. I lived in a confession booth, listening to my own secrets, making my own sentences. Confession, my uncle was different in a way you could see. I was different in a way you could see. Only if you were looking. If you were looking, I could see. What I mean is that my uncle walked on crutches, so he couldn't cross the border by foot. He climbed into the trunk of a car, which is a kind of closet. I was like my uncle, and I was not like my uncle. He walked on crutches, and I didn't. Confession. During prayers, I don't close my eyes. Nobody knows this except for the other people who don't close their eyes. A life in the closet is a life that's closed. So I opened what I could. Books. I was Harry Potter, the boy who lived, reading about the boy who lived. I had no owl, no hat, no wand. I couldn't cast a spell, and I couldn't spell. But I could see the low in owl. I could pull the hat out of that. And in the word wand, find another hidden and. Reading X-Men, I wanted to be Storm so that I could end the famine in my family's village, looking like a badass bitch queen goddess doing it. I knew this was impossible because I wasn't claustrophobic enough. I could never be Storm. I survived too many storms behind a closet door and I could never change my name to Storm, which at its core contains an or, as in either or, as in Aurora Monroe, Storm's birth name. You must choose pink or blue, boy or girl, left or right, right or wrong, truth or lie, truth or dare, truth. Even writing this, I thought that feminine shared an A with famine, feminine, dare, hunger for errors, find another place to stick a man inside. Reading, I learned the difference between cloth and clove. Also the difference between close, meaning to shut, and close, meaning almost there. Sometimes there's no difference between the past and present as in to read and to have read. Sometimes there's no difference between the past and present except for the surroundings. You can call this context or you can call this what it is, privilege. Not living in the closet is what people like me did on TV. But I wasn't like the people on TV, so I lived in the closet. In Fun Home, when Allison and her father see a woman wearing men's clothes and sporting a man's haircut, she says, like a traveler from a foreign country who runs into someone from home, someone they've never spoken to but know by sight. I recognized her with a surge of joy. Dad recognized her too. Spoiler alert, Allison and her father were both in the closet, but they were not in the closet together. 
My room is a closet for my family's clothes. My clothes are, were a closet for my skin. My skin is a closet for my skeleton. It won't always be. It won't always be this way, but that's not the same as it gets better. Better requires context. A shell could be a spent bullet or the home of a mollusk. In order to breathe, you have to add the little snail of an E to the end of the word breath. Breathe. Is it not amazing that we are still alive? It's nothing amazing, but in the closet is where I first read The Voyages of Dr. Doolittle, marooned on Spider Monkey Island. The only way Tommy can go home is to climb inside the pink shell of the great glass sea snail. I lived in the closet, all wall, no window, so that if I turned out the light, it made no difference if I shut my eyes. That's how dark it got. I used to pretend I was Tommy inside the enormous shell. All window, no wall. But what was there to see at the bottom of the sea? Nothing except rare animals that learned under great pressure to make light from nothing but the nothing that they are. It was cold down there and lonely. My breath would fog the shell until I wiped it clear. But I climbed in when the great glass sea snail bowed its great neck to me and let me enter. Hoping I had enough air, heading straight for whatever waited on the next shore like any immigrant would. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Oh my, that was so beautiful. And, and, and I hear the sound, you know, you articulate that so well. And I, I love the rhythm and the sound. And I'm a big fan of Cheetos, so <laughs> that was great. Thank you. So I'm going to talk now about uh, the degree options and expectations for the MFA. And this fits in, this piece fits in with what Ben was just saying about genre and being able to play with genre. Most students come into the MFA to study only one genre, fiction, nonfiction, or creative nonfiction. We will be offering those three. And you would study uh, that one genre for two years. But you may find that you would want to explore. Maybe you heard a lecture from uh, Benjamin or Leslie and decide that you would like to experiment with poetry. So we have a mixed genre option where you could study in one genre for a term. Um, you would do uh, your one genre, so example you could be studying fiction for three terms and then do one term in the second um, genre and you would still be in your two-year window. Now if you want to to go all the way in and do a complete study of a second genre, we offer a dual concentration and you would be doing three terms in a major genre or two terms in a minor genre. So that would be two and a half years, you would do an extra semester. Uh, I did that personally myself when I got my MFA, I did three terms in fiction and two in nonfiction. And, um, and a lot of writers um, like that flexibility because this is an exploration and you have, you, you may come in thinking one thing about yourself as a writer and then learning so much that you become something totally different. It's absolutely wonderful and fascinating. Now for the actual uh, degree in terms of, of the work that you have to complete, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Olivia. So uh, you're expected to participate in five residencies a uh, six if you're doing the dual genre. Uh, you're expected to successfully complete four terms of work with a faculty mentor, five for the dual genre concentration. You would complete and present a critical thesis, 20 pages. You would do that in your third term. Completion of your creative thesis, 125 pages for prose, 45 pages for poetry. If you're a dual genre student, you will be expected to complete a creative thesis in both genres. You would uh, complete at your graduation residency a public reading of selections from your creative thesis. You would also complete a document reflecting on your work in the program and an assessment of where you might venture next in your creative journey, whether that be uh, seeking publication, teaching in the community or entering the publishing industry as, for example, uh, an editor or an assistant editor or a copy editor yourself. 
uh, you'll be working or you're required to work with at least three different faculty mentors during the course of the program. And you will be doing extensive reading. You'll be developing a list of reading each semester with your faculty mentor. And you will uh, prepare when you graduate a cumulative annotated bibliography uh, showing the completion of, of what you've read in the program. So now we have our next faculty readers, Jim Daniels and Anna Clark. Now, Jim Daniels is actually a graduate of Alma College. He graduated from Alma College in 1978. He has authored 28 collections of poetry, six collections of fiction, and four produced screenplays. He has also edited or co-edited six anthologies of writing. He is a recipient of two fellowships from the National Endowment of, uh, for the Arts and two from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. His books have won three Michigan Notable Book Awards, the Brittenham Prize for Poetry, the Blue Lynx Prize for Poetry, the Tilly Olson Creative Writing Award, the Milton Kessler Award, and three gold medals in the Independent Publisher Book Awards, among others. And his films, yes, he writes for the screen, have won many awards in film festivals around the world. And if there had been a commencement at Alma this spring, Jim was supposed to be the commencement speaker. Anna Clark is the author of The Poisoned City, Flint's Water and the American Tragedy, named one of the year's best books by the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, Kirkus, and the New York Public Library, Audible, and others. It won the Hillman Prize for Book Journalism, the Rachel Carson Environment Book Award, the Gross Award for Literature, and it was a finalist for the Helen Bernstein Award for Excellence in Book Journalism. She is a longtime teacher of writing and improv theater in all corners of the world, high schools, colleges, prisons, detention centers, soup kitchens, tech incubators, and more. So thank you both for joining us. Jim, you're up. Unmute myself and uh, talk a little bit about what students might expect working with me. Uh, I'm really big on revision and I actually enjoy working on students to help them revise their work and getting it towards uh, you know, possible publication. And I can certainly uh, give advice in terms of that because at some point, you know, if you're in a program like this, you want your work to get out into the world. And I think all, all writers, uh, serious writers do. So I'm happy to help out with that. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty open to a lot of different writing styles, often very different uh, from my own. And I also, uh, yeah, I, li I liked what the Benjamin said about just trying to figure out what you're trying to do in your work and try and help you do that better as opposed to being uh, overly prescriptive in term. In other words, there's a lot of different things you can do to make something uh, work as a poem or a short story or as a screenplay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a, as uh, Sophronia said, I'm a cross genre writer myself. And, uh, you know, and I, I blur them in prose poems and things like that. So uh, I, I'm very flexible. I, I, I'm an enthusiastic reader, both of write, you know, published work and work by students. And uh, I really like the one-on-one the -on -one mentoring uh, process and the larger sense of community that I already feel this program is uh, beginning to have and fostering. It was wonderful. It's uh, been wonderful to sit here and listen to uh, my, my new colleagues re, uh, share their work. It's, uh, it, it's very exciting. So let me just read, a, uh, because of the, you know, the, the time factor, I'm just going to read, read a couple of poems here, but poems that might be at least representative of my work in some way. So this first poem I'd like to read is called House of Drumming and House of Song, and it brings four of my obsessive subjects in to the same poem. Uh, one is, I'm in Pittsburgh now and my family here and my life here, my family in Detroit where I'm from, where I still continue to go uh, back regularly and my interest in music and my interest in work as a subject, uh, you know, coming from Detroit to, uh, and seeing so many people uh, 
in my family working in the auto industry and working there myself for a time, uh, it's something that has really interested me. House of Drumming, House of Song. Here in Pittsburgh, my teenage son and daughter sing their carefree fizzy joy. Digging in the yard, I hear their voices rise and fall through open windows. They can carry a tune. They have pockets big enough sewn by minor gods with magic thread and endless dreaming. In Detroit, we never sang, not the boys, not the girls. We listened to rock so loud our ears smoked, but we were not singers. We drummed car seats, dashboards, and each other. We lit lighters and held them aloft at arena shows. How could singing be for sissies when our heroes sang? Equations and formulas, mysteries and historical texts, electrical currents and gym class ordeals, red arrows and one-way streets, woofers and tweeters and teeters and totters, all led to the same factory boats, both anchored and beached on the shore of the lake of industry where we would row in sand to the gritty stop of retirement, bailing water the whole time, mechanizing even our dreams cutting them short with precision tools so that breathing itself became our only song. We lost the hook, never found the refrain. We played extended drum solos identical to our fathers while the crowd slipped away to the john or felt each other up or passed joints or simply nodded off while the rest of the band drifted in the shadows of dazed drinking. When they returned, we accepted polite applause for our endurance and steadfast lack of creativity. My father never sang. In the middle of mop, dust mopping, my mother sometimes swept in the song, grabbing the closest child and howling, Ozzy Osbourne channeling Patsy Cline at warp speed. She seemed so happily out of herself that we fled. Laughing, she chased us. We laughed too, afraid of wanting to get caught. I still don't sing except alone in fast moving automobiles. So I left that old life long ago. The heavy metal job, the muffled solitary drumming, long lines of tiny bodies, somebody smirking that we all looked alike from above. I dropped through the trap door and into what I've been calling my life for the last 30 years. If there's a beat of a different drum, I have not heard it. I wanna carry one long note that slowly sinks into silence. My father jokes that our happy birthday gets dogs a howling, so we avoid even that. Straight to cake and ice cream for us. We vote for listening. We vote for mad clapping. We vote for golden oldies. We endorse the air guitar and the broomstick mic of lip syncing. My mother hobbled by daily pain. I have not heard her sing in 2000 years. Math and song entirely outside the sin's circle of our existence. My mother, a red planet on her own rectangular urban orbit. I wanna hear her say, you don't like my singing? I'll just sing a little louder and longer. A lesson we should have learned to hell with polite applause. Even the weeds enjoy getting pulled, or so I imagine, freed by the dazzle and flash and sheer volume of my children's young voices. The sound waves on their way to Mars or Cincinnati or to the mobile home in Sterling Heights, Michigan, where my 85-year-old parents are just now stirring. And perhaps while my father makes coffee and my blind mother attempts to butter toast, not her fingers, somebody against all odds might briefly and quietly hum. And uh, this other poem I want to read is uh, a villanelle. So, you know, I do write in forms and appreciate the musicality of them. This is a villanelle-ish because I, I break the rules because what's, what's the point of a form if you don't, if you don't break it? Uh, it's called Private Room, and it's about a very serious illness my daughter had. My daughter got sick and nearly died, fall of ninth grade. She combed her hair out. I kissed her goodbye and goodnight each time I left, and she had no choice, attached to grim tubes, prone, ashen. My daughter sick and nearly dying, 
of embarrassment as doctors probed the mystery and fought among themselves. I missed her goodbyes and goodnights. We watched an old movie from childhood, no game shows or reality. 14, my daughter, sick with worry she would die, I slept on the floor and wept. I pressed ice packs against her to stop tremors, then kissed her since I could. Good night seemed insufficient. So did I. No curfew in that moonless room without boys. My daughter got sick. Death passed her by. I snuck her home. We did not kiss. Good night. And I'll just stop there. Thank you, Jim. Sure. That was beautiful. Anna. Hello, everyone. I am so glad to be here. I am just a complete fan of this whole community. And I'm really excited to see how it keeps growing and emerging and um, how it's shaped by, by you students who come and make it uh, whole. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm a journalist. I um, have, I'm a freelancer. I'm a full time freelancer, um, which means I get to uh, my curiosity gets to take me in many different directions. I write lots of different kinds of stories about lots of different kinds of things. Um, uh, but I actually came up uh, with in fiction writing. That was what I did for most of my life. And it's what I studied in college. It's what I did my own low residency MFA in. Um, actually in my twenties at the time when I think a lot of people do traditional programs. Um, I think I knew that this sort of one-on-one -on -one mentoring um, model would be more meaningful to me and and it really was um, so um, I, I just in teaching I mean like others have said I, I think part of the excitement of teaching is that you get to be agile you get to learn you know see where students are follow some of their curiosities um, it, it's very dynamic in that way um, but I think um, I think some of the things I'm most interested in is really like honing in on the sort of core curiosities that um, are fueling you, um, whether there's a, you're coming to this program with a book idea, something you're really passionate about, something you really want to do, or so you, maybe you're not really sure um, what you want to focus on yet. Maybe you're still discovering, but like learning the practices um, of, of, of being a storyteller for your whole life. Um, seeing the world like in the possibilities of stories in questions in this sort of like a mindful inquiry you know that um, um, I think is uh, becomes a kind of devotion uh, when you give your life to writing and also the discipline you know like I think um, like really like you know taking on the challenges of, of, of hard work you know um, of learning how to like you know just give it the time and to stick with the discomfort of really hard revisions or giving up stuff, you know, that you spend a lot of time on, but actually isn't just working out, like just really learning how to like um, do that. I think that's part of the worth of a program like this is you get some practice in it, you get some support while you're doing it, you get a community while you're doing it. And that's the kind of, you know, tough work that I think it takes to really make a life um, in doing this. Anyway, what I'm gonna share with you is something really short. It's, um, actually a little bit different than what I normally do. I'm not normally a character in what I write, but this is, I am in this one. It's, um, and it's also older. It came out like six years ago, but um, it seemed appropriate for what we're doing. And that it involves, um, it has a kind of storytelling <laughs> theme. So um, it starts out as like this. One of the members of our improv workshop a baby-faced man in his 30s made up a rule. The last person to arrive has to do a cartwheel. A shaggy-haired man with creaky knees manages a groaning little hop, while another wheels like a shot of light. In this fluorescent-lit classroom at the Macomb Correctional Facility in Michigan, it's the willingness to take a risk that counts. My friend Matt Erickson and I lead the improv theater workshop at this medium security state prison 30 miles outside Detroit. Improv is about freedom. And so there is a built-in challenge and deep irony in attempting to practice it in a prison. On Thursday evenings, Matt and I sign in at the prison and then move through the bubble, 
a white room containing a metal detector where we show identification, remove our shoes and are patted down by a corrections officer. We hook PPDs or personal protection devices into our pockets. The beige contraptions have a pin to pull in emergency this. We've never needed them, though once during a game of freeze, the PPD fell out of my pocket and went off when it hit the ground. Officers rushed to my aid and then rolled their eyes when I explained what had happened. For an hour and a half, we guide our participants in games that prompt unscripted collaboration and play. We transport ourselves into a forest, a white castle, a Transylvanian train. We imagine ourselves as prom queens and CEOs. I had led uh, prison poetry groups for years. So when I began this workshop, I wasn't so much of afraid of incarcerated men as I was of improv itself. <laughs> I'm accustomed to writing and revising stories before sending them out into the world, not making them up and acting them out before an audience. I was afraid of looking like a fool. But these men have such an infectious joy in improv that it makes me feel safe. They often take the lead, hardly typical for prison activities. Wilmot, a 42-year-old man with this warm, shy grin, recruited new members for the group and encouraged cautious ones. Anything you got going on out there, he'd say pointing toward the door, you leave it. To break out of our rut of realism, Wilmot invented a game involving dozens of genre cues like sci-fi or Western on slips of paper. We laughed, <laughs> we laughed helplessly while one inmate played a terrible waiter in a musical singing an improvised rhyme with his wire-framed glasses perched snootily on his nose. The workshop can be transporting, but it's impossible to forget where we are. Most of our members committed violent crimes. Two were juveniles when they were sentenced to life without parole. The United States Supreme Court has ruled that this is unconstitutional, but Michigan has refused to apply the ruling retroactively continuing battles on whether to resentence the state's 350 juvenile lifers leave them in apprehensive uncertainty. You can't hope too much, one of them said. Hope will kill you. In May, Matt and I attended Wilmot's parole hearing. The board interrogated him about the 1992 crime, which was armed robbery and assault with intent to commit murder that had earned him multiple life sentences. At the hearing, he wept, saying, this is not the life I was supposed to live. The attorney general's representative nudged a box of tissues across the table. Just after a June performance we staged for inmates and guests, Wilmot was paroled. We absorbed the news with astonishment, joyful and disoriented at losing a core member of our group. As for Wilmot, he didn't know what to expect. How do you build a life outside prison after years behind bars? Since Wilmot was locked up, the internet came into use, cell phones, social media. Wilmot was, is on a crash course of trial and error. He couldn't get a job without photo identification. He couldn't get an ID without his birth certificate, which didn't survive decades of incarceration. Wilmot's family drove to state agencies hundreds of miles apart before the problem was sorted out. Some cities treat reentry as a municipal service, assisting with identification issues like these, as well as with jobs, mentorship, and voting rights. Detroit is not one of them. It's improved some since then. But. In August, I invited Wilmot to join a group of friends at the Detroit Improv Festival. I'd last seen him since, at, I, I hadn't seen him since the July homecoming party at his mother's house. And I was still startled to see him in blue jeans and a button down shirt instead of his blue and orange uniform. Wilmot had never seen improv outside of prison. In the theater, we watched scenes ignited by prompts that were familiar from the cinder block room at Macomb. But what most captured Wilmot's imagination was the downtown that he hadn't seen in two decades. Man, he exclaimed as we brought the car to a stop, a parking garage. Ain't never seen one of these before. Let's take a picture. No one has a script for Wilmot on where to go from here. He's grateful to live with his sister and for his full-time factory job, but he's lonely. He asks about the workshop. He doesn't know his way around the city anymore. 
He's dependent on rides, so he's saving slowly for a car. All right, all right, Wilmot says when I ask how he's doing. Just got to keep moving. In other words, he's improvising. That's all. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Okay, and I'm also, you also gave me an idea. I think you're gonna to have to do improv with the group at the residency, <laughs> because I think it's like you said, it's all about storytelling. And, and I think that would help with, with working on first drafts, for example, right? Learning how to create on the fly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay, so now we're talking about the application process. How do you apply to get into the Alma College MFA in creative writing? So the requirements, uh, we need your college transcripts from each college or university attended, your uh, CV, curriculum vitae, or resume, a creative writing sample, okay, maximum of 25 pages for fiction uh, or creative nonfiction, uh, 10 pages of poetry, a personal essay. Now, the personal essay will discuss your specific interest in Elma College, why this particular MFA and your preparation for pursuing a formal study of, of creative writing. Um, and this is basically about, you know, how do you feel that, that this will benefit you as a writer? You know, what are your strengths and weaknesses and, and what do you hope to explore in the program? Uh, and also any experience that, that you feel that you can bring to our artistic community. And also um, that you're doing two essays. The next is a literature essay, which is all about the books that you've been reading and writers that have influenced you. So we can know more about uh, what has developed you as a writer. Two letters of recommendation. And these are people who, who don't necessarily have to know your, your writing. You know, these can be letters of recommendation um, stating to your um, ability to focus and organize and, and how, to, um, how you would be able to uh, balance the work of the program with your life. Uh, basically that, that you have your act together. Uh, the deadlines for these for the application, uh, if you're starting in the summer, the deadline would be May 1st. And if you're applying for the winter residency, that deadline would be November 1st. Now you should know that if you apply for the summer residency and the cohort is full, you may be asked uh, to start in the winter. So, um, so don't be afraid to apply early if uh, that even if you feel that um, you may end up starting in the winter and that would be okay. So um, actually I will pause to make sure, are there any questions I need to ask, answer right now, Olivia, before we go on to our next set of readers? Nope, we are all set. Okay, excellent. So now um, I'm happy to introduce to you uh, Danielle Clayton and Karen E. Bender. So Danielle is a New York Times bestselling author of the Bells series. And she's the co-author of Tiny Pretty Things, which debuts very, very soon as a Netflix original series. So look for it. She's also the author of the forthcoming MG fantasy middle grade fantasy series, The Marvelers. She hails from the Maryland suburbs of Washington, DC. She taught secondary school for several years and is a former elementary and middle school librarian. She is COO of the nonprofit We Need Diverse Books and owner of Cake Literary, a creative kitchen whipping up decadent and decidedly diverse literary confections for middle grade, young adult, and women's fiction readers. Uh, an avid traveler, and I love saying this from her bio, Danielle is always on the hunt for magic and mischief. Karen E. Bender is the author of two story collections, Refund, which was a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction, shortlisted for the 2015 Frank O'Connor International Story Prize, and longlisted for the Story Prize. Her collection, The New Order, was longlisted for the Story Prize in 2018. She is the author of two novels, Like Normal People, which was a Washington Post Book of the Year, and a Los Angeles Times bestseller, and A Town of Empty Rooms. Karen has received grants from the Rona Jaffe Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. She is the fiction editor of the literary journal, Scoundrel Time. Thank you both for being here. Danielle, you're up first. Okay, great. Um, 
just quickly because I'm going to jump in. I'm a little bit of the wild card here. Um, definitely, uh, my background is in children's books and young adults. Um, and I also read and I'm writing my first adult novel now um, in genre. I do science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction. Um, and I truly believe that my primary goal as a writer is to entertain and impart truth. And so if you're in workshop with me, that's what I'm going to be nagging you about, asking a lot of questions about um, how you're taking me on this journey and what do you have to say to the world? Um, I usually center my work on things that make me angry. Uh, and so I will be pushing you to dig deep and think about the things that motivate you and the truth that you wanna tell. And so I'm gonna do something a little fun tonight and read about some vampires. So I have a vampire short story, which I am turning into my first adult novel right now which I'm almost finished with. And it's called, this is my answer to Anne Rice. And it's called The House of Black Sapphires. A little different than what everyone else is reading, but hopefully you'll stick with me. They said the Turner women of the House of Black Sapphires were a little strange, that they were just too beautiful, that they were up to no good. They said the Turner women were vampires. And whenever that word appeared, it was time to go. The Turner Firebird would start the morning song from its window perch. It knew when too many were watching, whispering, and surveying the beautiful black women who floated in and out of the peculiar apothecary turned house, their ever moving coffin of sorts. B hated the word vampire, and whenever they arrived in a new city, just like now, she braced for it, for all the other immortal folks to lump them together when they were decidedly not the same. Her entire family and their 13 trunks clogged the mahogany seats of a New Orleans streetcar. Mama had said they were headed to the Eternal Ward, one of five versions of the city run exclusively by those like them. That this was home, one B had never seen before, one Mama wasn't sure she ever wanted to see again. But as B looked around at all the humans scrambling about, she thought everything seemed normal here. The perfume of the mortal sweaty skin Skin and the sound of their beating hearts made Bee's serrated tongue flare. She was eager to feed after such a long journey. As they snaked down Canal Street, a sticky breeze clung to her and she couldn't fathom that they were headed to a beautiful, stilted version of this place. Bee's five sisters excitedly pointed out everything. Her oldest sister, Cookie, complained about how sloppy and unrefined everyone dressed. Sora wanted to wander into every perfume shop in the French Quarter, while Annie Ruth was on a hunt for the best bookstore. May talked about how she could put her paint set to work with all the colorful buildings and iron lace galleries and balconies. And little baby bird's mind couldn't keep up with her tongue as she commented on every strange thing she spotted. But Bee was sad about leaving Charleston, South Carolina behind. She'd grown fond of the sweet town with its cobblestone streets and weeping trees and sweet grass baskets and kissing Reginald Washington hadn't been too bad because his mouth always tasted like the peaches from the tree in his mother's yard. Her room there had had its own clawfoot bathtub, which never stained, even after so many blood baths. It had overlooked the old Bethel church. Who knows what she'd see outside the window in this next home, if it would be just as lovely. They'd been in Charleston for a good little while, almost fooling B into thinking the bird, their honey, might not sing again and they'd stay put. Maybe this time she'd find an eternal love. She and her sisters used to make wagers about what city might be next and how many years or decades or millennia they might stay until the firebird song would wake them, remind them that they must leave. B had stopped counting now, no more clocks, no more calendars, Mama forbade them, and it was just as well. The hourglasses were all they had, all they really needed. She wished they'd head back to Paris. It'd been at least a hundred years or so. The window boxes would be blooming with pink terrariums this time of year, and it wouldn't be so hot. Maybe she could see Annabelle, the girl she used to bite and kiss when she was bored, see if she enjoyed eternal life, see if she, see if she might be B's eternal love. They'd left too soon for B to determine. Should stop should be coming up, Mama said, end of the line. Doesn't look like anything, her littlest sister baby bird said, her long twists hanging outside the streetcar window. Mama snapped her fingers, be still baby. Each time they went to a new town or a new city, these questions changed. A deck of cards reshuffled, 
the newest one plucked becoming her current obsession. This time she couldn't stop thinking about love. This was the city where her parents met, where her mama bit her father long, long ago and they'd become eternal partners. This was the place mama fell in love. She was determined to have that too. She would have a great love story here. Her wish drummed through her, determined to settle in her bones. The streetcar stopped. The driver stood robotically in it and exited. The warden will come any minute now. Mama turned to face B and all her sisters. B's heart squeezed with anticipation. This ward is full of bad water and bad news. It's a place that breaks your heart. Her dark eyes landed on B. The heat of her warning caught in her searing brown gaze. The one lovesick Turner put on notice. We'll bide our time, then move on. This was a city Mama feared, but B was determined to discover why. A white man dressed in all black stepped into the streetcar. Who is that? B's oldest sister, second oldest sister, Sora asked. A warden, Mama whispered. Now hush, not a word from any of you, not until we pass on through. She stood, greeted him, and smoothed the front of her dress. Papers or key, he asked. Key, Mama replied, handing him a curious bone white skeleton key that B had never seen before. More questions bloomed inside her, but she put a hand over her mouth to keep them from tumbling out. The warden inspected it, the Turners, the eternal ward. She nodded, welcome home. He smiled and revealed the sharp points of his teeth. He sat in the driver's seat and turned a series of cranks and gears. The streetcar oscillated left and right, breaking free of its cables. Mama took a deep breath. It's going to be fine, Evangeline. B heard her father whisper. The streetcar moved forward. Clouds swept in, darkening the sky. The day went to night. Water rose beneath them, slapping and sloshing against the sides of the streetcar. B gripped the wooden bench and her eyes grew wide with wonder. Lights illuminated the way ahead like a scattering of lightning bugs putting on a welcome show or performing a warning dance. B couldn't decide which wish. A jolt uh, shot up her spine. An iron gate rose from the water and flickered. Different versions of it appeared one after the other, turning from licorice black to velveteen violet, to emerald green, to a rich coppery gold, finally settling on a bloody, bloody crimson. Mama took a deep breath as the red gates opened and the street car sailed forward. I'll stop there. Those are my vampires. <laughs> so, so finish that book. I want that book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it'll be done at the end of the month. So I'm super excited. Fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And and yeah, I'll be. I don't think I've read about vampires since Anne Rice. So I'll be excited uh, to delve back into. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Yay, yeah, oh my gosh, I feel so nourished and inspired by all these readings. This is just awesome. And I just, um, I also feel like this is gonna be a special community and I'm so I'm so honored and happy to be part of it. Um, in terms of my own teaching, I feel like what I really value and trying to help students do is find their own strangeness. That I feel like we're all told to see the world a certain way. There's all these ways that we're, you know, not really, allowed to be ourselves. And in writing, that's where we can be honest. I feel like it's one of the few places we can really be honest in our world. And um, so I really want to help students find what they want to say, how they can be honest, uh, then, you know, find the tools of craft that will help them. Um, and then patience. I think patience is huge. You know, revision will actually help you get to places that you never thought you could as a writer. Um, and also reading, that reading is conversation with books that we love and we all love different books. And, and I feel like as writers, we don't just read books, we eat them, <laughs> we like, we wanna give birth to them. We're just like, they're so important to us in this deep way and to find the books that you wanna have a conversation with and that you're responding to in your way is what I feel like as a teacher, I can help you do. So I'm gonna read, my own work is realistic. Um, I started out feeling like the world was so strange. I just wanted to present it as real as it as it could be. So I wanted to find the sort of extraordinary and the ordinary. And then in recent times, I've become more like, how do you find the ordinary and the extraordinary? And it's gotten a little more surreal with time. So I'm going to read you a new short story called The Shame Exchange, which is not exactly real, but I kind of wish it was real. <laughs> um, OK. Um, no one knew, I can't read. <laughs> no one knew who originally proposed it, 
the government would mandate an exchange of shame. Citizens who held too much shame, which interfered with their lives and productivity, would come to an official site where their shame would be handed to a government official who had none. Many people in both the federal and technology sectors were involved in organizing this exchange and it had not been easy to agree on the terms. The government was for years not sufficiently responsive to the needs of its citizens. And this is what a panel finally decided to do. The citizens would be selected by lottery and interviewed and those who were unduly burdened by their shame would be asked to participate. Psychologists would create a technique in which they could detect a person's shame and make it a physical hulking thing. It was generally the size of a large pillow and resembled a raw steak. Before this exchange, selected citizens stored their shame in a refrigerator carefully packaged by medical professionals and would present it in this controlled environment to those who had none. The meeting would take place in a large warehouse somewhere in the middle of the nation. Though there was much interest in the details of the exchange, who gave what to whom, etc. No one outside of the participants would be allowed to watch. The event would be heavily guarded. No one was allowed to meet or speak to one another. Everyone was instructed to wear a mask, a simple plastic one constructed in the shape of a lion, dog, rabbit, and other animals to conceal their identity. They would all be told to dress professionally for exchange, but in clothing suitable to an office. The shame would be transferred between ordinary citizens and officials in the government. Elected officials would be required to undergo a test. Those officials whose shame did not reach a certain appropriate and decent level were ordered to the warehouse at the appointed time. Every member of the legislative, judicial, and executive branches would be required to take this test. And some would try cleverly to impersonate shame when they had none. But the test had questions that revealed these attempts at fake shame. Psychologists had worked very hard in these tests and all attempts at false shame would be detected. As word spread, more and more citizens signed up to hand over their shame. They could drive themselves or were provided in a pleasant air conditioned bus from their homes to the warehouse. More buses were quickly added as citizens in buzzing excited numbers signed up. As soon as certain elected officials were informed of their low scores of shame, they were escorted to locked vehicles that would transport them to the warehouse. No one quite knew what happened in the locked vehicles, though the rumors were that the politicians were during that final ride given anything they wanted. This had been negotiated with much back and forth in backroom deals. The vehicles sped across the country, not stopping until they reached the warehouse. The ones with no shame enter a large, empty, light-filled building and stood across from the ones who were handing over their shame. The two rows of individuals stood across from each other wearing masks, which made it appear that everyone was about to engage in a dance. Armed guards screened for the capacity to resist bribery or threats, stood around all of them watching. The ones with no shame moved slowly, coolly, but under their masks appeared to be scanning the room, trying to detect who was there. Those in row one clutched their bags of shame, the heavy the bags heavy as though they contained broken, dripping melons. Some bags would be thick, double bagged, as shame was both heavy and had a tendency to leak. There was a sharp and bitter odor of rot. They looked embarrassed, shoulders hunched, even if they're handing over this burden. They understood all too clearly what this entailed. They could not meet the eyes of the ones in row two. Some even seemed reluctant to hand over their shame at all, to burden another with it, but that was what they were here to do. Row two, held out your hands, announced a voice. The ones with no shame refused to follow instructions. They did not hold out their hands. The guards had to grab their hands and forcibly lift them up. The guards pried the fingers of the shameless ones and forced their palms open. No one said the recipients had to accept the shame willingly. A few of them screamed and a couple large bodyguards stepped in to stop some from running away. A couple of individuals in row two chuckled as though not believing this would actually happen. Row one, 
place your bag into the hand of row two. Those in row one, some weeping or trembling, lifted their own bulky packages of shame and placed each one in the hands of the person standing opposite them in row two. There was a deadly quiet in the warehouse. The guards pressed the heavy packages of shame into the palms of those who had none. The ones in row one stepped back. They looked at each other and laughed. They were advised just to keep a handful of shame for themselves, not giving all of it up to the rows in one, two, in row two. A handful of shame would help them get along with family, friends, and work. A handful, that was all. Some had to be discouraged from keeping more as a great majority of shame had to be given to the ones in row two. The warehouse was silent for a few moments and then echoed with the sound of one person laughing, then another, then everyone in row one, the pure sound of being unburdened, relief. The ones in row two clutched the packages of shame or more accurately, the guards fit their hands around the packages. There was a deep silence, though some officials began to cry in a choking, confusing way. It was the first time some of them had cried. Everyone in the warehouse watched them with interest, wondering what they would now be. Everyone in row one left the warehouse and zipped out to the rest of their lives. Shame plinked onto the concrete floor the ones in row two now held shame in their hands forever. The warehouse was almost empty now. Outside, drivers stood by the vehicles that brought them here, waiting for the officials to come out. The drivers of the cars had been gathered in small groups, chattering with each other. When they saw the officials now burdened with shame, they quickly went to their respective cars and stood very still. In a few minutes, they would drive the officials back to the capital, where they would return to their work governing the nation. Those who'd organized this exchange had no further plan. They expected only the ones in row two would govern with sensitivity and in a kindly way. Would this happen? They checked that the locked vehicles held food that the officials had requested, though some might be so distraught they would not eat. Had the locked vehicles been cleaned? Were skilled therapists on board each vehicle? Were people knowledgeable about a variety of policies ready to ride back with them? Now that they were burdened with a great deal of shame, the officials needed to be treated with a bit of tenderness. This way, said one organizer, the ones in row two filled out, filed out slowly. The shame was now part of them and packages could be taken to a sterilized and locked facility. Organizers in hazmat suits took the shame from their hands, set the packages into a special truck. The politicians moved slowly and with deliberation. They would not remove their masks until they were safely inside the cars. Many people here were afraid to see their faces. So much work had gone to this exchange, so much planning. Was this finally the strategy that would help the nation? The organizers watched the officials get into their cars. The car started, turned, and drove onto the highway. Those at the warehouse stood watching the cars vanish into the distance and everyone carefully cheered. That's it. Um, so writers talk about stories and things that they wish they'd written. Karen, I, I remember the first time I read that or thinking, I wish I wrote that. <laughs> it's just so brilliant. The idea of getting rid of your shame and giving it to the shameless. It's, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to uh, let everyone know that um, we are missing a faculty member. Kiese Lehman uh, is at another reading right now, so he couldn't be with us. And uh, just so you know, he's going to be joining us actually in 2022 because he's finishing a movie right now and he's got a lot of other things on his plate. So he will be with us um, in a year. Uh, and just so you know a little bit about him, his best-selling memoir, Heavy, an American memoir, won the 2019 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction, the 2018 Christopher Isherwood Prize for Autobiographical Prose, the Austin Riggs Erickson Prize for Excellence in Mental Health Media, and was named one of the 50 best memoirs of the past 50 years by the New York Times. And um, he recently uh, signed a new book deal, uh, three essays from his newly reissued book of essays, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, were selected for inclusion in the Best American Series and the Atlantic's Best Essays. 
and his debut novel, uh, Long Division, will be reissued in 2021. Uh, and it was honored with the William Saroyan International Prize for Writing and was shortlisted for a number of other awards, including the Believer Book Award by the Believer Magazine and the Ernest J. Gaines Fiction Award. And next time we have him on, um, I'll have him talk about that because this, this new book deal of his is interesting because it's for two new books, but it's also for the reissue of two books that had been previously published with smaller presses. So, um, so that journey may be interesting to some of our students. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about this night um, before we finish up, because I know um, you guys uh, will want to go to bed. Uh, tuition. Honey, we have one, sorry, we have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this uh, attendee asked, is it best to apply much earlier than May 1st for the summer residency and will places be granted on a rolling basis? It is on a rolling basis. Uh, you will have a decision. I believe it, that we're trying to uh, turn over the applications uh, in two week periods. Uh, if you want to start this summer, I would advise that you, that you do apply early. Because if, as I mentioned before, if the cohort fills up, you would have to start in the winter. So if you definitely want to start this summer, I would recommend applying early. Um, the tuition is, as I mentioned before, on our web page. But a couple of things I wanted to talk about here, and, and the reasons why I have the numbers here in front of you, um, I wanted to point out the Refer a Writer Award. So you can have someone refer you for, and this is on our website, they click a button and they refer you. And if you matriculate, then you get a scholarship in that person's name. So for example, if you are uh, one of Anna Clark's students and um, from, from one of her other teaching activities and she refers you to the program and you decide to come to Alma, you would get the Anna Clark um, Award, $2,000 scholarship award. The other thing I would like to point out is that if you already um, work for an employer that offers tuition benefits, that they may um, offer um, some form of, of payment or reimbursement for you for earning a degree. Now, I, I mention this because um, there are so many people who don't know that their companies offer such a thing. Um, and it's, it may vary. So for example, um, I used to work for a place that would pay 50% of any class that you took. And if it was relevant for, to your job, it could be 50 all the way up to 100%. So, um, and I mentioned this, I, I take it for granted that people know about this, but um, I just spoke to a friend last week who has worked in, in a large company for 15 years and did not know that she had this benefit. So. So there are ways for you to, um, to, to meet the financial obligations for this program. And we hope that, that you will avail yourselves of them, including you know, checking into federal financial student aid. Uh, we do hope to have more scholarships um, as the program grows and we start um, seeking them from alumni, from foundations and corporations. But this is where we stand right now. And I, I hope you will, um, you know, not let this be a, a deterrent to you coming to us uh, for uh, your writing and to prioritize your writing life. Uh, we have another question, Sophronia. Uh, do you accept or have a policy yet for students who may want to transfer to ALMA? To transfer from another MFA program? Yes, I believe so. I believe that's the question. Uh, I had not thought about that yet, but, but we could figure it out. I'm sure it would be on a person by person basis. So it would be a matter of, as with any transfer, um, understanding what work that student has done and the quality of that work. And, uh, and yeah, we would accept transfer students. So connect with me so that I can have details and we can talk about where you're at, whoever that person may be. Uh, on our next slide, um, we created this document which is um, your MFA decision journal. And if you could move, um, uh, move the slide forward, Olivia. <laughs> so this is a document that you can download on our website. And it's basically a workbook to help you think about uh, some of what will, what will help you come to the decision to pursue an MFA. And 
you know, we are all writers and this is a, a big thing to step into uh, thinking about earning a degree. So I figured, well, why not give you a space in which to write down these thoughts and, and to put it down on paper and to look at it so that you can be confident in your decision to pursue the degree. You will, you will have it on paper and they will be your answers. So if you haven't already done so, I invite you to go to the website and get that workbook and fill it out. So we are now at the end. This is it. This is the wrap up. Uh, Olivia, if you could go to that last slide, you'll see if you don't already have it, um, this is my email address. Um, I can answer more questions now, but if there's anything else that we haven't talked about or you wanted to talk to me about questions such as transferring, that's my email address. I am happy to get on the phone with you to talk more about the program. Is there anything else, any other questions? I'd like to thank our fantastic faculty, by the way, for, for being here and for reading their amazing work. Uh, you see uh, the talent that you have waiting for you and the wonderful community that we're putting together here. And we would love to have you be a part of it. Uh, I don't know if those are questions in the chat, uh, Olivia, or if they're comments, but it looks like we're doing okay. Yes, I don't have any questions on my end or in the chat. Okay, excellent. Well, this has been recorded, so it's available for you to watch again. And I would, I would watch it again just to listen to these amazing readings. But again, feel free to contact us. If you wanted to ask questions of any of the faculty, we can connect you to them as well. We are the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing. Thank you for joining us for this open house. We will have more events in the future and we will be happy to see you there. Thank you, I'm Sophronia Scott, have a good evening.